Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to look at the question of what the lactate threshold is. We're going to look at the history, the measurement and the application of the lactate threshold. And we're going to start by looking at lactic acid itself and a very basic def definition of the lactate threshold. Now lactate was discovered by Carl Wilhelm Scheele in 1780 and Scheele is also a co-discoverer of molecular oxygen and so from a bioenergetic perspective he's one of the most important names out there and a few years later another Swedish chemist Berzelius discovered lactate accumulating in the muscles of hunted stags and from that he deduced that it's something that's produced during high intensity or exhaustive exercise. What Berzelius also discovered was two different isoforms of lactate the L isoform and the D isoform and it's the L isoform that occurs in abundance in both human and animal muscle. And the Germans would pronounce this Milchsauer, which gives you some indication of where lactate comes from, so sour milk. It's important to note that when we talk about lactate, we really do mean lactate because lactic acid is almost totally dissociated at physiological pH into a lactate ion and a proton or a hydrogen ion. And so we have a typical uh, way of saying lactate when we mean lactate. And so the lactate threshold is the point at which blood lactate first starts to rise during incremental exercise testing. And in that simple definition is about 50 years of intense controversy over what this point is, what it means, and the underlying physiology. Indeed, if you put a dozen physiologists into a room you'll get at least 13 definitions of the lactate threshold and potentially many more besides. But when was the lactate threshold first measured? Well you could essentially say that it was Harding Oles in 1930 who first measured a lactate threshold and what he and his collaborator uh, Claude Douglas, he of the Douglas bag fame and a supervisor of Roger Bannister in his later career. What they did was a series of walking exercises where they rested for an hour and they walked for half an hour and they measured blood lactate at rest and after half an hour of exercise. And they did this at various speeds. And what you see here is the resting data in the black circles and the exercise data in the white circles. And you can see that below 7.5 kilometers per hour, there was no difference between the resting and exercising lactate concentrations. But at above 7.5 kilometers an hour, all of a sudden there's a difference. And that difference grows as you increase the intensity above that point. And this is Oles's point, or as we now call it, the lactate threshold. And you may be wondering why this rest and exercise lactate measurement is important? Well that's because these were done on separate days because back in the day if you were to measure lactate you had to do it by titration and that's a much more laborious process than uh, current measurements. So in titration what you first do is take a venous sample of lactate and then you have to measure that lactate. So how do you do that? Well you use a lot of glass uh, and clamps and essentially uh, glass heavy wet chemistry. And so this is the setup that Olds would have used, or at least a similar setup. So you have a uh, vase here, beaker here, where you've actually got uh, sulfuric acid in this, and you put your sample in there, and then you boil it up to get rid of the impurities, and you put that into a collecting vessel, and then you discard it. Then you boil it up again with a new vessel, this time um, containing bisulfate, and by boiling it up and then adding potassium permanganate you essentially oxidize the lactate creating aldehyde. The aldehyde then finds its way by aeration into this flask and once that process is complete you remove this flask, you add a starch indicator and then you add iodine and the amount of iodine you add until you get a, a pale blue color by titration the amount of iodine you add is proportional to the amount of lactate in that particular sample, the lactate concentration. That whole process takes about half an hour. And so that's why you can't do an incremental exercise test and then measure lactate as you go along using this technique. 
In the mid-1950s, another technique was developed, and that technique is the basis on which all off-the-shelf lactate analyzers work today. So here we see the YSI uh, lactate analyzer that we used at Aberystwyth, and here you see an Analox analyzer, which we've also used before. Both of these use an enzymatic technique to measure lactate concentration. And that enzymatic technique is relatively straightforward. It's lactate, lactate oxidase that you use. And essentially what that does is oxidize lactate using oxygen to form pyruvate and hydrogen peroxide. And these analyzers work by measuring either the substrate or the product. And so the analox analyzer measures the oxygen consumption of this enzymatic process. And the rate of oxygen consumption is proportional to the concentration of lactate in the sample, whereas the YSI analyzer uses the rate of hydrogen peroxide production by a measurement at a platinum electrode. And from that, you can get a lactate sample within 30 seconds to a minute, because you're measuring the rate of something. You don't have to use up all the lactate in the sample or all the substrate in the sample. You just have to measure the rate at which it occurs, uh, because the enzyme isn't limiting in terms of the rate of, uh, of that reaction. And then you measure lactate and usually as you can just about see in this particular case we're measuring capillary blood lactate. So how do we go about interpreting whatever we get? Well we can measure it from the artery, the vein or the capillary. Now vein and capillary sampling is much more common than arterial sampling because of the technical difficulty but in most sports science laboratories it's capillary lactate sampling that is used in lactate threshold testing simply because it's more convenient and therefore much more common. The best way to do that is with arterialized capillary lactate so you put your hand in hot water or a heat chamber or if you're using an earlobe you would use a vasodilator to uh, increase the flow and therefore you get a nice free flowing sample uh, and that's relatively easy to measure or easy to collect at least really important to note that blood lactate is not a measure of lactate production. In fact the value you measure represents the balance between lactate appearance on the one hand and lactate clearance on the other. So here we see a classic figure from uh, George Brooks. This was published in uh, David Paul and uh, colleagues recent review. What you see is the lactate concentration in the blood and this is the lactate rate of appearance which you see with the black line and the rate of disappearance which you see with the dashed line and it's only when the rate of appearance outstrips the rate of disappearance does lactate concentration start to rise and there can be all sorts of reasons why those two things are out of balance. The main players in producing changes in lactate concentration in the blood are the monocarboxylate transporters or MCTs and they're expressed in almost all cells and they are responsible for lactate efflux from the muscle and lactate uptake in the muscle and other tissues as well. And that means that only some of the lactate produced during exercise is ever expressed in the blood. Luckily we know that there is a good correlation between muscle and blood lactate in general but you can't rely on that. Um, and this is the reason. Here's another figure from one of Brooks's papers and what this shows is a, an oversimplification admittedly but it is um, telling the story so we have a muscle fiber here in this case a type 2b or as, as we call it now type 2x fiber producing lactate some of that will end up in the blood some of that will immediately be consumed by other fibers these type 1 fibers and some of that lactate will find its way all the way back to the artery and then that will be uptaken by other fibers as well so what this shows is that blood lactate concentration is in a constant dynamic flux and so you can't really infer lactate production from lactate concentration but you can infer that an increase in blood lactate represents a change in the relationship between lactate appearance and lactate disappearance you can start to think about physiological stress and strain and so after the invention of the enzymatic technique, researchers got very interested in this, particularly Carmel Wasserman's laboratory, uh, in terms of looking at uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing and what that means for patients. David Costill's laboratory was more interested in looking at it from an athlete population perspective. So here we see some data from uh, Roy Shepard's laboratory in untrained individuals, 
and Costil was comparing this to trained individuals in terms of when lactate starts to rise. And what he showed was the lactate threshold tended to be higher if you were well trained. Not substantially higher, perhaps 10% higher, um, though those reports suggesting that you get lactate thresholds of 90% VO2 max plus in elite athletes. That's not actually true. They're probably more reflective of critical power or the maximal lactate steady state. And then Carmen Wasserman's laboratory has done extensive work on what he called the anaerobic threshold. And what you see here, this is the, uh, if you like, the important line. This is a four minute staged incremental test. So four minute stages, blood sample at the end of each one, and you can see lactate starts to rise beyond the threshold. And that's coincident with a number of other changes in metabolic response. This line represents a one minute incremental test stage and this is the same participant and you can see there's a delay here because a one minute staged incremental protocol does not allow sufficient time for the blood lactate to be reflective of the steady state blood lactate if it was to appear and so you get a delay in the apparent threshold. This is why we do three to four minute stages in our lactate threshold determinations because you get a more stable uh, lactate or a more representative lactate response. And this leads me to the perfect lactate plot. This is the best lactate threshold plot I've ever measured and it shows a number of things. First of all it shows that unlike uh, some scientists I've talked to they suggest that the lactate response to any exercise is curvy linear across the whole range. Well, no, it isn't. You can see very clearly there's a flat line here. So there is definitely a baseline. This baseline can be annoyingly wobbly, but in this case it isn't. And then you see a sudden and sustained increase in blood lactate concentration. That is the classical definition of a lactate threshold. But like I said, this is an absolutely perfect plot and they don't always look like that. So there's been a strenuous effort to find other objective measurements of this threshold point. Some of them have been more successful than others. And this has led to what I consider to be a recent bloody classic plot from Jamnik and colleagues, so uh, in collaboration with David Bishop. And what this shows is a number of different thresholds. In fact, there are up to 25 different threshold measurements you can make that try to measure the same thing. So here we have the log-log lactate threshold, the D-max lactate threshold, the increase above baseline by 0.5 millimolar, the onset of blood lactate accumulation, 2 millimolar, 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4, and then you've got the modified D-max, etc. Now for my money, the only one that comes close to a real lactate threshold is this log-log uh, lactate threshold. And that's because the sudden and sustained increase is occurring in this region here. I could buy these others up to perhaps an including uh, Obla 2.0 and the uh, one millimolar above baseline and this measure is what Ed Coyle used in a lot of his uh, endurance performance studies. So provided you use a, uh, or if you're um, consistent in the way you use these things it's not a great problem but you really do need to make sure you're measuring the right threshold. So I would argue that modified DMAX or log poly modified DMAX is probably more representative of the maximal steady state than it is the true lactate threshold. And uh, well, as for OBLA, the onset of blood lactate accumulation for millimolar, if that's an onset, then uh, well, come on guys, it's definitely not an onset. The onset's down here somewhere, so you've missed it by a mile. And that's really crucial because you don't want to miss the threshold for reasons I'll come on to later. But the reason there's so many different threshold markers is because the lactate response to exercise does vary considerably from individual to individual. And just to give you an example, here's a typical cycling club uh, performing lactate threshold tests, if you can call the Istwith Cycling Club in Aberystwyth typical. But from this plot, you can actually see the various members of the club and what they're probably good at. So here you have the champion cyclists who win all the cups at the end of the year at the Christmas dinner and then you see these guys are almost certainly all those that go out on the Sunday club ride together and this is the guy that also goes out on the Sunday club ride but gets shelled out the back as soon as they reach a hill but everyone loves him so they keep him in the in the mix anyway. And this lactate plot is the only one for which uh, an obla type uh, 
assessment would work. So delta or the obla 2 mil 2.5 or 2 or 2.5 millimolar would probably just about hit what the lactate threshold probably is. And note, you've got an incrementing baseline there. That's quite common to see. But if you take the 4 millimolar, what the 4 millimolar will do here, it will differentiate between individuals, but it is not measuring the threshold properly. And that's absolutely key. Because why is the threshold important? Why is lactate threshold important? Well, if you get the lactate threshold right, it demarcates the moderate and heavy intensity domains. And below the lactate threshold is the only domain in which you will find a classical steady state can be achieved. And that's really crucial to interpreting physiological responses, as I've mentioned in relation to VO2 kinetics, but it's also important in setting training intensity zones. So for those of you that use polarized training, zone 1 is below the lactate threshold, zone 2 is between lactate threshold and critical power, and zone 3 is above the critical power. The other thing a lactate threshold can do is, is show you training-induced change. So a right shift in the lactate threshold is an obvious marker and a key marker of training adaptation. And so with all of that in mind, next time what we're going to do is have a look at why it is the lactate threshold correlates so well with endurance performance and what the underlying physiology of that probably is. All it remains for me to say is thank you very, very much for listening and I'll catch you next time.